Brothers, welcome to the Beloved Son podcast, where we explore what it is for the Catholic and Christian layman to live in the identity of Jesus Christ and to walk in his journey. This is Dr. Phil Chavez, and I'm joined by Chuck Harvey, and we will dive deep now into how it is we can move in Christ as a beloved son of God and perfect ourselves as finished men. So before we begin, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we're just you're so grateful for all you've given us, for this privilege to be your beloved sons, to move in your image, to walk in his identity. Father, we just hope that in this podcast that your truth will come out, that your spirit will be sent forth, that if we gave you a mic, that's all that will come out of this presentation. Father, so we ask you to, again, order the beginning and direct all of its progress. Father, we, we hope all will be pleasing to you. We ask all these things for your son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Chuck, what do you have right. today? Well, you know, I've been thinking uh, we're kind of a quarter of the way into the school year. And one of the things that, um, you know, I try to do with my students is talk to them, think about love and marriage and the responsibility of being men and women. And, you know, one of the things that I, one of the things I knew was true, but I guess it's, it's even more personal now that I, uh, I work with kids so much is, is, is the amount of, uh, well, boys and girls, but let's talk about boys first of all, who who grow up without a father in their home sure. or, you know, maybe they have a father who they visit sometimes, but some of them have no father, right? And so I'm just wondering how fatherlessness can really affect uh, a young man's ability to think of themselves as a, as a beloved son. Does it actually kind of um, maybe even keep them from being able to relate to the idea, let alone open themselves up to to that as uh, a way to find maybe the peace they're trying to find in their life. Yeah. You know, I think that would apply in some way in, in terms of walking that journey with a beloved son, I think it would, th there would be a difference depending on the age. Now, of course, if a fatherless son, who's, I would say who's 19 is very different from one who's 29, but because the, the one who's 19 if he has, if he doesn't have a father, was raised without one, that what's going to happen is he's going to be in a situation where he's not even going to be able to navigate in relationships so much. Where if he's 29, he's got certain relationships in his life that will enable him into some way uh, come into his own and and start, I don't know, looking at things more relationally and then understand his faith relationally. Where I think a, a young kid who doesn't have a father is going to have a hard time just connecting the, and just seeing even viscerally like, yeah, I need, I, the being a beloved son to God just sounds right. And it feels right. A young man probably wouldn't get to that point if he doesn't have a father. This is why when it comes to older men, generally, I don't really give them a pass for having, let's say a father wound or an absent father in connecting with, as a beloved son of God, because by that time they've increased the maturity and They've increased in a certain sense that they connect with their own hearts. You know, as you know, it's a big deal for me. You know, in fact, I did this two weeks ago at a conference where it's always powerful when you teach men about what it is to be a beloved son, when you get the men to connect with their fatherly hearts toward their sons and what they would want their sons to say and respond to them, right? So when you go through these exercises, you know, of, of father to son and son to father and incorporate that in your heart, you can say, oh, wow, yeah. God, the father he wants to be my father. I, he wants me to be a son. Boy, that makes sense. To a young person, I, I don't think that can make very much sense because, again, they haven't been navigated relationally. So there, there is that struggle. So, so is it even, I don't say it's not impossible, but how hard is it for them to even understand, a younger person, understand that message if they've never experienced it? Do you think that there is still something, some such a natural uh, need for it that it, that it can connect anyway, or is it? Uh... I think it's possible. What one of the difficulties is, you know, it's I think with young people too is that you know even in my ministry generally, well, well you could call in some way religion like self improvement in a way. And what I mean by that is this: is that when a man gets older, he wants to improve himself, right? He wants to. He there's something is truth out there that he wants to search for, especially if he's. He's 29, he's got the degree, he's got the job, maybe he's got the wife, and he, if he's in young as 30s, he's probably got a couple kids and whatnot. And so that kind of guy is looking to become a better man. 
He's looking to be uh, to develop something more of himself. So he's looking to improve himself where a young person is not on that quest, right? And so one of the, one of the problems is, is that the reason why connecting with religion may not in any way become a priority is because he's too interested in, yeah, getting the degree or going, you know, uh, you know, meeting his friends online to connect with Xbox or finding the girl or whatnot. So the problem is they're not interested, and I'll use the word self-improvement. They're not really interested in some kind of quest to develop themselves. And so in that way, it's, it is just harder to wake it up. However, what I find though, even, even speaking to young adults, in fact, I did this about two months ago, talking about the beloved son, the beloved daughter, they got it when I explained it to them. But it's not as though they're going to go home, or I, at least I didn't see any any of them come back to me or respond by email or whatnot, going home and having that impact their life and follow up. Where a young men, I would find that by young men, I mean a guy in his late 20s, early 30s, when he hears that message, he's going to want to pursue that. He's going to want to go after that. So I don't think it's hard to get a teen, especially if they're open, to understand a certain truth, like being a beloved son of God and how that sounds of itself very um, appealing. But the problem is, even if you get to that place of seeing that, yeah, gosh, it does sound like a good thing. Yeah, I, I kind of would like that. They're, they're not so much as apt to pursue that. And I, because their interest level just isn't there for, for a movement of faith. And so a man who, again, who embraces, I think, what is to be a beloved son, he embraces in some way the, a, a desire to be on a, a strong path of faith, right. it seemed to me. So it seems like, you know, a lot of people today, a lot of young men, um, I mean, I see it definitely at the high school level, but it hasn't started with the kids I have right now, that more and more there's people who just simply are not, they're, they're nuns, right? I know any, they haven't been catechized. They, they yeah. don't really have any kind of background in, in in any kind of christian faith so it's like they don't even have the categories sometimes in yeah. their language right so so uh, sometimes what's the chicken and the egg is is it to try to um ex explain the faith somewhat to them to get them the categories and then talk about the beloved son or is it trying to just almost forget about the the theology and 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 try to get them to to tap into their need for uh for fatherhood but yeah, then get your, them to open their hearts up to um, to Christ and the faith, and and then all you know, then the theology and the, the belief. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, when you bring that up, what comes to mind is that there's an idea too. I think it's a universal idea, and it's a natural idea that there's some kind of God or gods that we have to follow, right? I mean, all civilizations had that at instinct in them that a religion was something or some kind of way to God or some kind of path to him and some kind of sacrifice is due to this divine being. And so that's a universal sense. And that's kind of hard to wake up in a young person. But to your point, as part of your question is that, yeah, is it would, would one, and before waking them up to maybe what it would be to be a beloved son of God, you have to wake them up to, to the value of religion in their lives. And I think maybe that's right. You'd have to wake them up to the value of God in their lives and they go back and, you know, to use their, I mean, every, everybody's got sensible experience, you know, especially if they're in, in their teens, they can understand a lot of their sense experiences. Maybe in a child can't be moved so much that well, way, but a teen can. And so you could talk to them about, yes, well, you know, the order of all things, how did this all come to be? And how is the body and all of its parts so perfectly ordered? Did that just happen by an explosion or chance or something? So yeah, I think to get somebody thinking that that God is 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 exists or must exist because he's the cause of all things and he orders all things and ordains all things. Maybe that is a place to start because then you want to talk about this God and then then move from him to being just a god to him being a father. And then you could try to move in and talk about the beloved son, the movement to well he's in this father and son relationship, you know, there are rules in the house and there's a house which we would otherwise call the church. And so the father and son are to live and abide in this, in this church. So, yeah, so I think there would be that gradation of things to be chosen. Yeah, because you're not going to get very far, I think, with a young person 
in making the case about becoming a beloved son of God when when they don't even have that first denominator, their God involved in their lives or, or, or pursuing them has any real value to them. That's That's got to be, I think, and to, to understand the beloved son message, connecting with God would have to be established as some kind of val pre-established value to be to be attained or achieved and to be sought for. And then to, to teach that, well, it's the beloved son really that's, if we could move in that mode, that would be in some way the most engaging as opposed to following a bunch of rules and regulation or just making it about divine worship or in the Catholic sense, making it about being sacramentalized to move from sacrament to sacrament. Right. And um, yeah, so so yeah, I think I think yeah, I think the case could be made, you know, with young people, and I, I, particularly in their teens, that we got to wake in their experience to want to connect with with God and um, to be to be to see that you know some kind of worship or honor or some kind of uh, uh, something is owed to him uh, because of because of what he created us and the, what he gave us. Right. Now, I guess where I sometimes feel I get some traction, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. I think it applies to teenagers or even young adults or older adults. Is to is to first focus on, you know, what do you desire. Mm, like get really yeah. people to think about what is it you desire? What, what do you really, if you really, you know, and, and, and they'll often start with the external stuff. Well, I want money. Well, why do you want money? Mm, well, so yeah. I can get things. Yeah. But why do you want things? Right. I mean, eventually you get to the thing. Well, I, you know, I want to be happy. Well, what would really make you happy? So you have to get them to think, Oh, isn't it true? Cause they, they resist. Isn't it true that you'd really be happy if you were known and loved? Like, wouldn't that make you really happy? And then, then they sort of like, Oh, so, I mean, is that maybe the way to try to get people who have no uh, religious uh, experience? It's almost to get, they need to almost get back in touch with themselves and really think about, well, yeah, what is it I really want? And if I really want that, where would I find that? As opposed to, hey, there's this thing out there you should find. And they're not even, I think they're out of touch with, with what they really want. Yeah, and I think that's a good way of connecting with that need for God. Yeah, to tap into what they want. You know, it's interesting. On, I think on, on some sense, a deeper level um, for what you were talking about is not simply what they want, is kind of what they're passionate about or what, what strikes them. You know, it's interesting. If you show interest in somebody, um, in their, in, in what's going on in their life, like, you know, like, you know, I deal with my nieces and nephews, you know, and, you know, when they were young and real little kids, you know, Uncle Phil was everything. Now that they're, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, Uncle Phil is just, he's not, they're not interested in connecting with him, right? So, right. so what, I, what I do find is that I talk to them about what they're interested in, about what they're passionate about, because then you can get them open up and then you validate their passion. So usually, yeah, an opening questions I usually have with a young man too, or young woman, or, you know, I ask them, what, what are you passionate about? And it's fascinating some of their answers, right? And it's some, I would say, well, I'm sad to say, like here in Southern California, the majority say, oh, I don't know, um, you know, but some some do have an answer and it's kind of neat to see them come alive. And so it's good to try to connect with them. You know, as you know, as well as I do, you know, teaching adolescents, you know this better than I do. A lot of it's about engaging their interests before you even teach them is to show them you're interested in them. And so that's um, that's why I approach it. I got I to gotta tell you the story. I don't know if I brought this up on another program, but I was. Um, I was at, I asked this kid from a church, I think I was traveling or something, and he was the son of a of a man I knew. And so I asked him, so young man, what are you passionate about? And he said, lacrosse. And I thought, wow, that's impressive. I thought he said the cross, you know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I just want to pursue the cross. But he said lacrosse, you know. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I forgot that I was on the East Coast or something like that. That's not big out here in California, though it is growing. But um yeah, so so it is the case too. Yeah, especially when you you get to to talk about yeah sport. Now the problem is too. I I have the problem of, of the issue with kids like other than maybe sports, just or maybe and and you know maybe uh, uh, the martial arts or something. I don't I don't connect with things the Xbox or anything that they're interested. in, A lot of them what they're interested. In. So so I struggle with that, and I'm not you know. I'm not in tune with, I barely know what an Xbox is. You know, if you ask me to describe what it is generically, I just couldn't even do it. But yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, but no, I, I think, I think a, a big part of just 
you know, there's there's things about God I think that we are naturally passionate about. And and those those passions, those they, they do meet those passions are connected with the desire that we have. And so yeah, I think you're right. If we awaken their desires and move from there, I think that's so, uh so in your in your experience um working with men, what 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 are their desires? What, what do they typically express as, as, in terms of what is it they think they're searching for? At least when you first sort of encounter them and and try to try to you know, help them think through uh, their journey, what do they what do they typically identify you, you know, as what they're searching for? What's interesting is. In, in, I, okay, they're they're searching. Okay, those those who would come to a conference or those who would just engage in conversation or whatever in the subject of religion. Again, presuming they want to engage in God, the question is how how do I do that, right? And so, you know, there's there's many modes we've devised or have risen in the Catholic Church. We can make it legalism. We can make it authority based. We can make it worship based. We can make it knowledge based. I make it divine son sonship based, right? One of the things I find, I was struck recently when, um, I forget what happened. It was a conversation I got into about two months ago where I kind of made it, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the father loving you. Why don't, why don't you make gestures of your love for your father? Like you would want your son to make gestures toward you. And a light bulb went off. With this man, he said, gosh, I never never really thought of that. Like, what kind of son do I want to be to my father instead of how do I want my dad to be a father to me, right? So I, I, I challenged him by flipping that. And so there's a desire we all have, which I think is all primal to receive the father's love. But in maturity, again, this wouldn't work for an adolescent so much. Again, as you know, most of the guys I work with are middle age. Are not, they're not adolescents. But... Mm -hmm is is you can find i think it's possible to have a man connect with his desire to want to be a great son to his father and waken that up in him and feed on that and nourish that and throw the fire th throw the logs on that fire how can you be just a better son and that way you know it becomes like well, not that it's under somebody's control. In some way, it is, you know, because you make in some way you make it a little easier. Wow, how do I get to accept my father's love? And I don't get all that, but oh, if it's about me being a good son, okay, I can figure out some things I could do for my dad. You know, I could I could sort of craft something together. So, you know, and so of course, if a man has a son, it's a lot easier because then you connect. Okay, what is this? Is simple. How, what do you want your son to say to you? And that's what you're supposed to say and move towards your father. You know, dad, life is great. Dad, thank you for life. I'm, it's great to be alive. Well, this is what you're supposed to say to your heavenly father. So men kind of like, they get it. It's just viscerally right, right? It just strikes the heart. So, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's, again, <laughs> working with an adolescent may be difficult to do that, but to, to waken them up to what it is to be a good son. I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, there's always that. There's that challenge too, or not to challenge, but maybe it's only it's it's somewhat a part too of waking up, you know, a man in his life where he he wants to please certain elders, like a like a football player wanting to please his coach. You know, it's one thing to make a touchdown, and we could feel really good about that, but we want our coaches and we want our fathers above all to watch us make that score, right? Mm -hmm. Watch us make that basket. And so sometimes maybe it is possible. Again, I don't work with you so much. Again, I work with young adults and that's, it's an easier, it's a re, in fact, it's a real easy step. In fact, I've never seen anybody reject the message of the beloved son um, that that's heard it or, or it's kind of just tried walking through it. They may not have pursued it because they got distracted with other things, but um, I don't know why I bring that up, but it, it is something natural, which, yeah, we want, we want to be loved by a father, but we also too want to be a good son. Right. So do you think though, uh, it's good to hear that. I mean, it's actually hopeful to hear that you feel that you know, people tend to react positively to it. Cause I guess I, I was wondering, I was going to ask is, um, you know, we live in a culture that's very hyper, uh, hyper individualistic and, and hyper, like in other words, personal autonomy is like the highest good often seems that way. And so I'm wondering if that's a barrier for people 
to realize the importance of relationship, including the relationship with, with a father. If, 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 if you're, if you're sort of grow up in this environment where self-determination and autonomy is the number one thing, you can almost convince yourself, well, I don't really need relationship. I don't need, I don't need to have the affirmation of a father because I'm my own person. Do you see that affecting people's perception of, of the need or, or to be out of touch with the idea of being a beloved son? Yeah, that's pretty, uh, that's a good point because <laughs> for me, that really hits home, right? Because when I was growing up, my father, you know, he, um, it was interesting. I knew him well, cause I worked a lot with him, but there was, there was still a disconnect. Right. And so of course I was the second of 10 children and he was, he, he was overwhelmed. And so my life was very individual, individualistic and very autonomous, very self propelled, you know, I could relate to Batman and the Lone Ranger. That was simple to me. So, um, yeah. And so I, I, even when I was like that, what happens is, yeah, when you are like that and you're moving outside of relationship in that autonomous kind of dynamic, that individualistic dynamic. And I was told by one mentor, spiritual director, he called me kind of shocked me when he said this. He said, he says, Philip, you're, you're radically individualistic. And he had, he had to add radical in there. Okay. <laughs> so, so I guess I must've been really that way, but, but I found, and so, so even relating to him, I thought was good, but I think what happened too, in all of his guidance, it was hard to follow because I wasn't respecting the relationship because of my radical individualism. Right. So um, yeah. And I think, I think that's the case because again, the individualistic person He's not, he's not relating so much. And so, you know, it's interesting. I was in a happy individualistic world. In fact, in some way, maybe I'm still like that too, because I mean, I have many people I, I mentor over the phone and all the rest, but I have all these projects which keep me very happy in life. Right. And so, um, and, and so of course relating and relationally isn't, isn't that hard for me. Actually, it's very, very easy. But my point is to say that an individualistic person often will have a number of interests that they're engaged in that take up their time. And those things can be very distracting. And those things can be very diverting from moving in relationship, which that dynamic of moving in relationship is in some way needful. And I would say more needful for a young person, again, to connect with the whole idea of being a son of God and that there being a, a relational exchange with God that basis of love, which is should be their basis of faith. Now, do you think the person like that is, is sort of involved in all these things because they're searching for purpose? Is that, is that why they're trying to fill their life yeah, purpose by right. having as many projects as possible? Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, in my case, too, I think I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, noble projects, you know, um, in the pro-life movement, academically, physically. Um, things I studied. So yeah, that's another way a man too. And I see this happen to other young scholars. I see this even young priests and definitely young seminarians where they, they are somewhat individualistic and they get so, they get so caught up in themselves and their learning and the things that they're doing and the projects they're engaged in. Um, I forget, I forget you, you made another comment or there was part of your question there, but but yeah, uh, try, well, trying to trying to find purpose out of all that, trying to fill yeah. a void of, of purpose in your life by, yeah, and it, I think it would if if some way if somebody's seeking, if they if they're not connected with a relationship, it's got if it's not who you are and who you relate to, it's got to be what you do. Right. So yeah, I think that's the way people. Even I saw myself, I think filling myself up, and I enjoyed studies, and I enjoyed projects, and I enjoyed the ministries. I mean, I no complaints came out of me, right? But but early on too, it took me a long time. I mean, I didn't see the beloved son message. And of course, it became very personal to my early forties. Okay, so so even before then, yeah, I um, was I open to it. What did anybody really explain it to me? No, but um, but yeah, maybe part of the reason I was kind of blocked in that message or hearing that message was was because I was so engaged in all these projects and all these things. Yeah, they, they can take you away. 
Yeah, I don't think it's an overstatement to say it's it's it really is diabolical, right? Because it's it's like we have a purpose, right? Our purpose is to be a, a gift to others, to be in relationship yeah. to others, and to sacrifice for others. That's our purpose, and our world tells us the opposite, right? Your 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 purpose is to uh, gain things for yourself. So it's like I guess it's no surprise that people are having trouble finding their purpose because they're <laughs> they're or finding meaning because they're they're told that you'll be happy if you gather a bunch of stuff for yourself. You're in fact designed for the opposite of that. And so um, I guess I can see how maybe it would be very hard for men to, to make that connection. So how do we, how do we sort of deprogram them out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the culture they're in? So they start to realize, Hey, I have a purpose. It isn't about me. It's about relationship, including, yeah. you know, being a beloved son, being a beloved son, not only in terms of, receiving from the father but also i have a duty to give to the father yeah and um yeah, that purpose that you put at it in relationship really what that is we sum that up and we say love right right god is love and um even the scriptures especially saint paul to the end of all knowledge is love you know i mean he, he even speaks even in john uh the beloved disciple also he speaks, you know, in his own epistles about, about, you know, in some way that vocation to love. And so, yeah, that has to be woken up. Um, and I think too, you know, there is something I think in every person that does want to go outside of themselves, right? Unless they're really so, I'll, I'll say like sickly self-absorbed or radically individualistic, <laughs> right? There's something in everyone that really does want to serve. You know, it's interesting. I remember even when I was a boy, I remember even like a little kid. I remember <laughs> yeah, my dad, in fact, I, I could still, I, I still have a picture of it in my mind. I, there was this um, push broom that he had that was actually kind of big, you know, and the handle was like, I don't know, five and a half feet, you know, and to me, it seemed like eternity, right? And so I remember even when I was a kid, I just used to love to like, please my dad when he watched when i when he watched me like sweeping with this big massive push broom right and so i wanted to please him right so i think even something there's natural something of a child you know and a lot of children too when they sometimes they see their parents distressed they'll want to do something for them they'll want to please them in some way now they may be confounded about how to but they oftentimes want to and sometimes right. you'll see them try to do things they kind of shape up or they'll still, they'll might, they might straighten something up in the living room or they might, they'll do something to please their parents. So I think there's something in us that does want to, to serve, to love, to please, to give of ourselves. Yeah. So, so that has to be, that has to be tapped into, you know, it's interesting and, you know, teaching high school, you know, this <laughs> better than I do, you know, it, it's, it's a little, it, well, in my day, we didn't talk about this, but I know a lot of kids, you know, and a lot of programs in confirmation, a lot of high school programs, there's now self uh, hours of, of service, service hours required, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I remember hearing about this, you know, I mean, you know, when I was finished with school and all the rest, and I, I don't know why it struck me as kind of strange. Um, I mean, it was a foreign thing. You didn't have anything like, I didn't have any kind of requirement like that when I was in high school or confirmation or anything like that. And in a sense, I think, well, it's a good thing because I guess part of that is so, you know, it's, it's to train somebody that they must need to give back to their community. I don't know about, you know, I'm, I'm, I, if it's a really good idea to make that, uh, you know, compulsory to, to make for confirmation. I mean, that should kind of just flow out of the person or even even high school, but, but in some way it's a good idea to get, get a young person, especially if they're not led that way, right. To, to try to, um, get in these, you know, very good, healthy, sound service hours. And of course, I think too, sometimes we've got, <laughs> got to be careful too, that it's not just about, oh, I got my service hours in by stuffing these envelopes or, right. I got my service hours in by, I don't know. Um, well, of course, doing the yard work can beautify. I mean, that that's sort of a service to make beautiful for the community. Yeah, but, but you want to uh, try to have them 
be in touch with somebody, right? Like yeah. go, go out and help the poor and be yeah. there with the poor and actually uh, be in relationship to somebody you're helping, not right, not just mail it in. Yeah, and to that point, it was my last experience in Rome where I was there for quite a while, a number of weeks. There was a little bit of a transforming thing I didn't see before, but it was in front of me all the time when I was started studying some of these saints and doing some of these videos of the saints. When I started researching, I started realizing, hey, all of these priests, these religious, all these brothers, and all these uh, women religious, women figures, women saints, they weren't necessarily in comments or something, but I started to see they were all serving the poor. They were all serving the sick and the down and out. That was just what you did. And I, I think what happens is one of the reasons, and I want to get too far afield here, why it's even hard for, I think, some priests to connect relationally, because many I know are very disconnected relation, relationally. That would change if they were serving the poor or the needy or the sick. And even to a certain extent, what you see too is that these saints just didn't kind of come right in, you know, and say some nice words and comfort and read out of the book, give a blessing and split. No, they they used to feed the sick. They used to tend to the poor. They used to tend to their wounds, bandage right. their sores. I remember Aloysius Gonzaga as a seminarian, what he died when he was, I, I forget, 23 or something like that, or he was a young man and a, 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 a seminarian in the Jesuit order. He used to actually beg for the alms on behalf of the poor. Okay. And um, so they, they would get their hands like, they, they would really get them dirty. And, um, you know, what's interesting is Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory the Great, he made it a requirement for all of his clergy in his diocese to it was either to work with the poor or the sick i forget or at least one of them but they had to work with him otherwise he told them if you will not do this you will be dismissed from my diocese and so it was seen as such an important thing to be engaged humanly with the poor and i, I wonder if too if this is you know, you see this i think too in young people and that's why i've noticed too you know because i don't know us so much now but maybe about 10, 20 years ago, there used to be a lot of programs for youth. Maybe they still exist today. I don't, I don't hear about them so much. I don't mean maybe because of legal concerns where we take youth to, to, you know, to Mexico or to poor areas to give them experience what it's like to see the poor and to build a house for them, right? Or to, mm -hmm. to do some kind of service for them to, to wake them up to to wake them up to see people in need to wake up something within them that that would engage them and engage their hearts to be empathetic or sympathetic and and to want to serve others to give themselves to others and generally i think that's a good thing mm -hmm. i think parents should lead their children into s situations where they are serving maybe if not the sick and the poor at least the elderly Right. Or um, and I, I think that's an important thing of maturation, too, because a young child should learn to respect the elderly. Right. And so I think keeping them a distance from them has done them a great disservice. But but it is important to give children those opportunities to be close to to the down and out or those or to the needy, let's say, and especially to the to the, maybe the fragile, like the elderly and whatnot. I know it was, a, in fact, now that I think about it, it was a big thing, even when I was a scout, I hated it, but it was, we had to sing at these convalescent nursing homes. Nursing homes right? for Christmas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did a lot of that when I was a kid. I hated it. I mean, I hated singing. So, but, but I, you know, going there, you sort of saw the need and then you kind of was a little transforming. You thought that, wow, these people are pleased by this. And you think, wow, that's kind of cool. And then, so there's, there was a fulfilling sense that, wow, they're they're happy that I'm here. They're happy that we are here, right? And um, 
Yeah, that would that that had some packing though. Again, I just I didn't like to sing. I'd rather have them. I'd rather sweep the kitchen, really. But that would have made me a lot happier. But but it is it is interesting that yeah that that I remember recall so much did kind of waken up with me when I had to serve them. You know, before you uh, started talking about that, I was going to ask you if if maybe that's something that for men they need to do more is is, is serve the poor. It's almost like you know we always. Well, at least my, my perception, sometimes in the men's movement, it's all about going into the spiritual battle. Let's go protest mm. outside of abortion clinic. Let's go fight pornography, which is all good stuff. But you almost wonder uh, to be more well-rounded as a man, as a Christian, and, and to and to be able to relate better to the idea of being a beloved son is yeah, go and serve the poor. Go get your hands dirty feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and actually do the corporal works of mercy. Um that might even have more of an impact in actually conversion, conversion of the heart, as opposed to just the sort of the more militant hyper-masculine aspects of the, of the battle. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think you're right when you say that, because I could think of how that really touched me um, in, in serving others. Yeah. I'm just thinking as well that, you know, it's so important, too, that when we do this, that we train or encourage others, especially, to serve those who are most immediate to them. In other words, I think sometimes we even miss the needs of those in our own families. Right. We're out trying to save the world. And meanwhile, our family's right there. Yeah. And then, uh, and then secondarily, like our own neighbors, those just around us. Right. You know, those... Um, you know, it's interesting. I remember one time I saw this woman walking with her kids in a park and I, I knew her cause she lived locally in this apartment complex. And I used to see her with her kids and I walked by her. One time I introduced myself and she's all oh, my sub husband's away in service and all the rest. And I said, look, here's my number. If you ever in an emergency and you're in trouble, go ahead and call me. And she was kind of shocked, you know, it's like, cause I was just kind of thinking, well, your husband's not around and you're, you're in an unsafe situation or you need to move a couch or something, you know, give me a ring. I'll be happy to come down. She was kind of taken back. Like, you know, she didn't, she didn't find that. I won't say she didn't take it. Well, I think she appreciated it, but she was kind of shocked by it. But right. the idea of us extending ourselves to our neighbors should be a natural thing. And, um, of course, I think with the breakdown family again, you know, we're we're disconnected with our neighbors. Sometimes it's not that we want to not it's not that we don't want to serve them, it's sometimes we're just we're just disconnected from them. You know, I noticed like um, you know, in Europe, one of the interesting things is when when you walk in their towns, European towns, especially in Italy, Spain, I'm not sure about Germany so much because I don't have much experience there, but these they, they they order the societies and the let's just say the apartment complex and the living areas where they're highly social. You know they they design them so people will gather. Right. And what's interesting when I notice now in a lot of apartment complexes that I see if I ever walk through or or even parks, I mean, I'm happy that there's fields and but it's not like they're as inviting as those kind of places you see in Europe, by which they yeah. make like they a plaza. Style out, yeah, they style out their piazzas and their plazas to make them look like pleasant places just to go to and just strike up a conversation. I know they exist somewhere here in the United States, but they're, I don't know, they're, they're designed to be that way. Mm -hmm. Where in the United States, I think sometimes they're just designed to be functional. Okay, we got a table. There's a barbecue if you need it. You could grill. You know, I mean, we're a little more functional about these things. Or then when we set these things up, they're kind of impersonal in a way. I don't know. Um, you know, we just we just make these things just serve a function today, and not design them to say now how can we really design these to promote community um, instead of just functionality. So, yeah, so that was that that's a big element, I think, in the European culture where they build that community a little more readily. Yeah, I noticed when I you know, 
a couple times I've traveled to Europe, it just seems like things are, and of course they're a lot older, but they're yeah, they're definitely on a more human scale. Where sometimes our public spaces here are not, they're designed more for cars. Mm. You know, and, and the humans are kind of <laughs> intruding on the cars, the cars <laughs> habitat, right? We're kind of yeah. in the way. And it, it, yeah, it doesn't, it, 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 it's designed for like, I just show up in my car, I get out, I do my business, I get back in my car, I leave and I'm not, yeah. I'm not interacting with other, other people, but you know, but I think some of that's changing in some of the design because then COVID comes along. Now we're all back stuck in our, in our houses. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm just trying to think again, I don't, I don't want to belabor the whole point about how our society is, and just, but, but it, it seems like, um, the other thing about maybe this is sort of an American thing to this sort of self self reliance and 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 ruggedness and 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 also self obsession. It's almost like, you know, the answer you'll get the answer through your own effort and and from within your own self. And you you shouldn't you shouldn't be looking for affirmation or dependence on anything else, including mm-hmm. let alone the idea of a, of of a, of your like you need some affirmation from some father figure or some some father up in up in the sky. It, it seems like it's antithetical sometimes to the whole uh, American ethos about, um, you know, happiness is to be found within and success is to be found by through your own rugged individualism. And um, it seems like that's, that's, that's a uh, inhibitor to men realizing that, no, they, they do need, they do need uh, the love of a father. You know, what's interesting is you're talking almost to bring up somewhat of an something almost antithetical to what you're saying. Everything you say is right. However, at the same time, there is something in the Christian that I believe on a certain level of self-fulfillment can be fulfilled just by union with God. In other words... You know, I, you know I me, mean, I don't like talking about myself so much, but, you know, I, um, you know, in, in the men's movement, there's a lot of talk about how you have to have a brotherhood, right? You can't make it without a brotherhood. Now, if that was available to me, that wasn't weird and or just doing weird things or the reason I'm not interested in a lot of these brotherhood movements, they have these discussion groups that just, I just think kind of boring, but, but, um. For on for me, it, they are. I, mean, I think for some, you need to learn faith and all the rest. They might be more interesting, but but there, I think for lack of them too, where I am, I I feel I feel complete in Christ. Now, would being part of a brotherhood amp that up? It was self improvement, I guess. I'll use self improvement. Okay, would that be better for me spiritually, morally, and all the rest? Yeah, I think it would. But I feel complete in Christ. You're not going to get out of my mouth, oh, you need a brotherhood, like it's absolutely necessary or something, or it's, it's, you know, at least in a secondary sense, most needful to, to grow in Christ, to become the human or the man you're called to be. So there is something by which I think we're supposed to be complete in Christ, but that completeness in Christ is supposed to be expressed as long as you're on this earth. Well, we'll be in heaven too, but in a communion with others, right? So I think there is a completeness. Here's the paradox. There, There is a complete, I mean, we talk about people being self-sufficient, all the rest, but one can be self-sufficient in Christ. I believe that, where God can be really fulfill them. I think that happened like John the Baptist. I think he was fulfilled. I don't think anything was lacking in him when he was out in the desert and, you know, eating locusts, wild honey, and, you know, and all the rest. I think, I don't, I don't think he was lacking in anything. Right. And so, but, um, and you see that in the hermit's life, you know, you never hear them lacking in anything. You talk about, they could, they talk about the spiritual trials, but on the contrary, they feel deeply fulfilled, but the, the fulfillment is in God. And so, and so those things, you know, was an absorption for, a um, a, an interest outside of God. But again, God should lead us to want to be in communion with others. He should want to, it should lead us to want to be engaged with others. And, and ultimately, you know, when you, you move as that beloved son receives God, God's love, you know, one should see that they're not just to absorb and receive God's love and have all their needs met. They must become that love, which they've received 
and you know reflect that back not just to god but to all others around them so with that let us close glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was, as the was in the beginning is, is now, now and ever shall be world, world without end amen, amen. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men's Academy YouTube channel. You can also find us at themensacademy.org and donate there if you feel so moved. God bless.